if you aren't already familiar with Scott, he's an extremely versatile photographer. He's photographed work for advertising, travel, editorial, and corporate clients. He grew up in the dark room learning from his father, graduated from, UV, uh, from University of Virginia with a fine arts degree and was lucky enough to be taken under the wing of a freelance photographer. Scott has a gallery in Lenox, Massachusetts showing his versatile scenes from all over the world, but Scott will be sharing his images from Block Island today, which is, um, and Scott, you probably know better than I do, but this is a small island that's part of Rhode Island right off the coast. Um, and stories from the images of his ferry ride to Block Island, which is the only way actually to get to Block Island. So thanks Scott for sharing your story and I'm going to pass it off to you. Great, thanks for coming. Um, actually, I have a piece here that um, I wrote as part of uh, an opening. We just did a show out on Block Island. Uh, finally, after shooting um, pictures on the ferry for off and on for 28 years, I thought it was time to do something with them. So we had a show at the uh, Spring Street Gallery on Block Island, which was a lot of fun. And um, actually when I was, I got up to speak to the people that were there for the opening, I, uh, I realized it was the only situation I've ever been in for one of my gallery openings where I, everybody in the room understand, ex understood exactly what I was talking about. Because you can't really get to Block Island without going on the Block Island Ferry. So um, the photographs today are from uh, these excursions that I've taken. And uh, basically when I get on the ferry, I feel like I've got 55 minutes to go explore and do whatever I want to. So these are, it's kind of like speed dating while you're traveling. And uh, these are the images that I've come up with on those trips, as well as some photographs uh, I've taken of the boat from Block Island. And then some, and we end up with some of my favorites uh, from actually shooting on Block Island, which is the whole point of kicking the ferry over there. So, um, let me know if you have any questions as we go along, and um, I'll give you some information on some of the photographs as we go. There we go. So uh, one of the issues, this is Block Island. Basically, it's seven miles long, three miles wide at the, at the widest point. Uh, it's shaped like a pork chop. And um, it basically covers 9 point, about 9.8 square miles. So it's not very big. Uh, it's got two major attractions, which are uh, North Light and Southeast Light. And after that, it's just a really pretty place. So um, I find that uh, it's just a great place to go and relax. And no matter how much, no matter how much, uh, how many computers or how much, any hard drives or projects I take out there, I don't seem to ever be able to do anything other than just enjoy myself. So it's productive from that standpoint. Uh, the ferry for me really starts when we get to the ferry dock. It's about a three hour drive for me. Uh, I live in uh, Lenox, Massachusetts in the Berkshires. I have a gallery there, some of which you can see behind me here. And um, so the drive itself, I'm not crazy about, but once you get there, I feel like I'm on Block Island. And because you get there an hour early, if you have a car, I get an hour to wander around the docks and see what I can find. So these first groups of photographs are from things I found waiting for the ferry. Uh, and these are wonderful uh, uh, textures that appear on the hulls of the ships that are there, all the fishing boats, uh, just reflected water. And because it's around the sea, there's also plenty of rust, amazing rust. This is actually the hull of one of the boats which hasn't been taken care of quite as well as the others. It was the illusion. And this is uh, what's happened to it with the, uh, the rust and the salt. Fishing nets. And then everywhere, the reflections in the water are just amazing. These are actually some of the bumpers, uh, the orange and red bumpers that the fishing boats put along their sides to keep from banging into things. Scott, could you let everyone know what um, camera you're using for these photos? Back in a, a trip across country with a couple of friends in 1972, I spent my last hundred dollars on a Canon FTB I found in a pawn shop. And, uh, and it came down to a Nikromat or a Canon FTB and I actually liked the Canon logo better. So that's how I started this career with Canon. Uh, it was a design decision. So I've been shooting with Canon ever since. And these photographs were taken um, 
Some of them were taken with film uh, with a Canon F1. Uh, and then uh, now currently they're being shot with a Canon, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, <laughs> um, it'll come to me in just a second. The, uh, it's, um, anyway, oh, that's funny. So uh, anyway, there's, there's light and shadow everywhere. Um, about this stuff, here we go. This was, I call this my pandemic porthole. Uh, during the pandemic, we were required to stay in our cars on the ferry. Um, and this one time I got really lucky because I actually had a portal that you could see out of. So this is my, my portrait of the docks as we were leaving. It's interesting, you experience a lot of inclement weather on the ferry. Some days it's gorgeous, and other days it's raining, and sometimes it gets kind of stormy. Um, but I always look at it as if there's no bad weather on the ferry because of all the elements you've got to work with. So there's always people, there's water textures everywhere, there's the ocean reflecting. Uh, it's just a, a constantly changing tableau of visual opportunities. Do you show um, people on the ferry the images that you're taking of them? Um, sometimes. Uh, it's a, um, it, it depends on who the person is. And, and basically, sometimes I just find them. Other times, if I see something happening, I'll go up and say it. And actually, a lot of it comes under the heading of uh, the statement, it's um, easier to say you're sorry than ask permission. So. Um, but I've gotten to know a lot of people that are on the boats. So uh, they kind of, everybody's kind of used to me wandering around with a camera. And if I see something happening, uh, sometimes I'll shoot it and then go over and talk to them and see if I can either uh, recreate it, change it a little bit, um, or else uh, just let them share and seeing what it looked like. And then you have a question. Um, would you consider your photos street photography intertwined with travel photography or would you consider your, um, your photos? Um, you know, I'm pretty much actually always trying to, um, to uh, let you see what I saw. Um, and so I'm, it's a, um, I, I think one of my gifts is being very observant. And I've, I've managed, I've managed many times to see things that other people have missed. So it's like a stylized photojournalism. Um, uh, when it comes to working with people, I spent most of my career doing advertising. So uh, I was on location a lot and I was working with models and sometimes uh, non-professional models and setting up situations. Um, and so when I, so it's like stylized editorial work. Um, if, if it's something looks great and I shoot it and I think it'd be, different or might look better in a different way. I'll actually go over to talk to people and then I'll reset it if they're willing, ask them to do it again. Um, and so this is uh, a lot of times though, it's really much just wandering about and, and looking for things that I find interesting. So it's a, um, it's a long way of saying it's pretty much, uh, I do this and this kind of work here is, um, it's just for fun and I'm sort of compelled to find photographs. That's what I do. Yeah, the boat gets pretty exciting. The water's wonderful. Yeah. Uh, a certain time of year that you like to shoot in Black Island? You know, it's, uh, we, uh, we, we, every time we'd gone out for the first 20 some years was because we'd go out in the summer for a couple of weeks. And then about three years ago, we were able to buy a cottage, um, which I pointed out to my wife that we were two of the only six people on the planet that wouldn't just tear it down. Uh, we decided that we wanted to, um, basically renovate it and keep the feeling of it. So uh, it was a little place called White Chimneys. And uh, it's only about 
maybe it was it was a thousand square feet. Now I think it's thirteen hundred, uh, but it's got a million dollar view out the back, which helps. So it's winterized. So now we can go all year. And one of the things that happens when you own a cottage in Block Island, a lot of the time is you rent it out during the summer so that you can have a cottage on Block Island. So that's what we do. We we have to suffer through spending the summers uh, in Lenox, Massachusetts, where we have Tanglewood and Jacob's Pillow and all sorts of other theater things going on. So it works out pretty well. And then people get to enjoy our cottage during the summer months. And we were pretty much there from uh, September through the following uh, May. So it works out well. Uh, so anyway, that to answer your question um, is that uh, I don't care. It's if I basically I go out whenever I'm there and uh, I get, do a lot of sunrises, I do a lot of sunsets. I can do a lot of sunsets from my backyard, which is nice, because uh, I look out over Long Island Sound. And, um, and I enjoy the, uh, I like ice and snow, and uh, so no, I, I shoot all year long. And as I said, the inclement weather makes for really interesting photographs. So this is the uh, beginning of a stormy day uh, on the ferry. And this is kind of what your horizon looks like from time to time. The boat does a lot of, a lot of uh, up and down. And fortunately, up and down is great. It's the pitching side to side, which gets problematic. And the great thing about being a photographer is I can get focused on stuff like this. So while people around me are horribly seasick, I'm just excited because it's getting better and better as time goes on. Um, so that's actually the spray of uh, Boat going down below the flow and coming back up. So that's water coming off to either side. And this happened actually uh, on one of our last trips um, coming back uh, this spring and that we had, um, we were in our car down on the lower deck and uh, we got going and the, and the storm really picked up right away, right out of the harbor uh, on Block Island. And so I shot this out of the porthole. Uh, so this was happening about 10 feet away from me, uh, right next to the right next to the boat. Um, this came. This happened right after a storm had broken. So uh, this the photograph is called "Welcome Aboard." It's sort of nice little energy coming onto the ship. There's patterns in color and light everywhere. And wind. So a lot of, we do a lot of wind on Block Island and getting to Block Island. So, you know, to have a day where you've got 60 mile an hour winds going isn't that unusual. And someone's asking, um... How do you obtain permission to publish, especially when someone is in the photo? Um, well, it depends on what you're what you're going to use the photograph for. If uh, ed, there's a lot of leeway with editorial, um, and I spent uh, until it sort of has kind of disappeared uh, most of my life uh, shooting uh, stock photography. So it was either the things like this that I found. Uh, that, that you could sell as a licensed image, or it was things that I actually produced as stock photography, where we got model releases. So um, if, uh, if it's something that's gonna be used for a commercial purpose, I'll talk to people and try to get a model release. And, um, and other things, if there's, uh, sometimes I try to shoot them in a way that you can't really tell who it is. Um, so that's, that's the short answer is basically, if, it's, if you can tell who it is and you wanna use it, commercial purposes, it's a good idea to get a model release. And sometimes that's a, I think it used to be legally you had to give them a dollar. And also uh, sometimes what we do is we just get all their information and send them a print. That works out pretty well. Or these days it's just a file. There's all these vignettes on the boats. So this is looking through the, uh, looking through one of the scuppers at the water, which is reflecting uh, a red speedboat next to the ferry at the dock. This is uh, uh, 
interstate navigation. This is their sign, which is on all of their symbol, which is on all of the, uh, the smokestacks of the ferries. And there's an enormous number of brides on Block Island or coming from Block Island. So this is one of the girls that had just gotten married that weekend. And this is, uh, I think, it, I think in, in Massachusetts it's called Patriots Day. They get a day off on a Monday that I don't think anybody else in the country gets. And so Block Island gets mobbed that day. So this is on the ferry heading back where they actually had to hold, had to leave a hundred people behind because it just wasn't room for everybody. Um, and I'm always, I love shooting into the sun and uh, getting those, um, you know, the patterns that where the, where the sun, where the light hits different pieces of glass in the, in the lenses. Um, much more interesting than just everything being front lit. And this shot, I did a show uh, in my gallery in Lenox uh, two years ago. And uh, that picture we saw earlier of the storm where you saw the blue water coming up on either side of the, uh, of the bow when it was crashing down. That image and this image were the most popular images in the show. So, and this is, uh, this is called Day Trippers Return. And it's basically uh, people that are just exhausted from all their fun and heading back on the ferry in the afternoons. And I know that this series is called Crossing to Block Island. So someone is asking how many of these images, I guess in a series, um, do you print? Um, this actually, uh, for the show, and I, well, I have, I'm looking over it right now. When I did the, uh, when I did the show in the gallery, there was about 10 prints that were 24 by 36s of uh, things like this picture here of the ferry with the sun rising behind it. And um, I made probably 30, 13 by 19 prints. Uh, 13 by 19 prints are the ones I make um, to really make sure that I've got the file correct so that I know from that point they can go as large as they want to. So I have a kiosk that always has those size prints in it that are mounted on boards. And then what's usually up in the shows is anywhere from 17 by 22 up to 44 by 66. And um, there's a picture in here that you'll see later of a tractor on Block Island, which I fell in love with. So we made a 44 by 66 of that, uh, which didn't sell at the show, but it's gonna go up in one of our local uh, cafes here with a show I'm doing on uh, farm to table photographs. So I, I, I shoot whatever I see that I like, and then oftentimes what's gonna happen with it come, becomes clear later on. And this picture here, a lot of the things that, um, a lot of planning goes into some of these photographs, uh, and this is the uh, this is the 6:30 boat out of um, uh, Narragansett that, um, that a lot of the contractors take during the week. And there's only a space, a spot of like two or three days um, where the ferry ends up in the right spot for the rising sun as it comes over block comes to Block Island. Uh, so this was uh, basically sunrise and um, and trying to catch that point where we get the two things to come together. So. And unfortunately, I had to leave to go home on the day that it was perfect. So, this is pretty nice. Well, this actually, this is one of the photographs that sold on the uh, when I had the show on Block Island. Um, I came in and the show and the the uh, print sales had been kind of slow. It was only a two week show there, uh, and then the day that I um, came back to Block Island to take the show down. I walked in and there was a couple in there and I'd set up a, a system of um, order forms. So if you saw any picture you wanted, you could order it in whatever size you wanted to get. And, um, and interesting enough, one of, the thing, one of the reasons that I did the show on Block Island because I, um, it's a small gallery and, and uh, visiting artists, which is what I was, uh, get about 15 feet of wall space. And, I'm kind of used to having 40 or 50 feet of wall space. So I was trying to tell a story in a very small space. Um, but I came in and there was a couple taking it out. And I really, I, anyway, the other thing is I wanted to meet the people that owned the ferry because I want to start moving in a different direction with the ferry photographs where I can spend more time actually photographing the people that work on the ferries. And um, so I came in and the guy was taking notes and, and uh, the man from the gallery said, well, they're, they're buying three of your prints. I said, well, that's great. And 
And I looked at the guy, I said, would you like me to take this down for you? He says, no, no, here, it says I've got to order. And I said, well, that's okay. Then my prince, and he goes, well, that's good because it's my boat. So uh, he and his wife, <laughs> he's wow. the owner. It's really Island, which is kind of funny. So I've got their name and their, uh, their address, their contact information. So I'm gonna, that's the next step of getting a little closer to everybody else. And this was a couple that was uh, just cuddling up on the ferry one night. And I, wanted, and I did talk to them before I took their photo. So now we're on Block Island. Um, and it's a, uh, uh, it's a great spot for me to go because it's funny in the Berkshires, the Berkshires is a hard spot to shoot sunset, but sunrises seem to be almost everywhere. So Block Island, it's kind of hard to go wrong for a sunrise or sunset because you're surrounded by them. So this is a sunrise up by the spring house. It's funny, someone in the chat, I know you can't see the chat, so I'm just gonna read it to you, but they said that they've never been to Block Island before or heard of it, and they traced their family's origin um, back to Block Island. So they're also a photographer from Colorado and, and really looking forward to going one day. Well, that's cool. Well, hopefully these will inspire you. Yeah, this is, I mean, it, it, it's an amazing light that happens. And, you know, when I was doing the whole edit, I, I could have filled up the whole show with nothing but sunsets. You know, it's, it's just extraordinary what happens off of my back porch every night. So, um, so I kept the, more about the things that are right there, but uh, it's, you know, this, this was a situation where you had sunrise and then the clouds managed to get hold of them in such a way that it looked like it was a sunset. So you had both, both things happening at once and then a reflection was great. Um, also, and uh, you can see these on my website too, if you do a search for uh, wind turbines, I, I, got, I got hooked on the wind turbines. There's, it's the, um, Black Island has that, I think the first uh, uh, offshore uh, uh, wind turbine farm in the country. And there's only, there's five of them there, but they're big. And um, so I started, started shooting them and then uh, I shot them all year long. So I've got them in all different weathers and, and uh, and times of day and stuff. And they're, I'm one of the people that happens to think they're really pretty. So uh, they're very dramatic and I've gone out and, and shot right underneath them too, which was fun. This is one of my wonderful whimsical things that about Black Island that I love. And, and, uh, and I've enjoyed this ever since I started coming there 28 years ago, because it's at the dump. And going to the dump is one of the, one of the things you do when you're on Block Island. So um, anyway, this is a, uh, uh, was a, um, uh, a boiler that an artist used as his starting point, and then he cut these figures out. And there's there's a couple of them there, and they're just wonderfully whimsical, and they've weathered beautifully. So. Scott, when you have shows, um, someone's asking if you could share a sample of your order form um, from the show, but could you just maybe explain what you put in the order form is it all of your images or is it a select amount of images and then they pick a size or what does your order form look like um well i can uh trying to think of what if it's i made the order form um and see i like to tell you i haven't it's been a long time since i had one i did it because they do things differently at the spring street gallery and do it very professionally uh to the point where this I've had galleries now for 16 out of 20 years. And I thought, oh, I could have been doing this. So um, but pretty much what I'm looking for is um, the title of the print. Um, and then, then right on the form, it shows the available sizes. So you can just check it off with what you want. And my prints go from 13 by 19 up to 44 by 66 and in between. So they can choose it that way. And underneath each one is the price. and um, and that really made it nice and easy for them because I wasn't in the gallery on Block Island. So they were able to take orders. And then we had an order, basically they take a photograph of it and email it to me. So, um, so that is pretty straightforward. And I'd be happy, anybody wants to get in touch with me, I'm happy to send you a copy of it. So I just made it up, it's pretty simple. Um, this is a photograph I took. Uh, interestingly enough, it's right up the hill from where I now live when I'm on Block Island. But this is when we were visiting 
uh, probably 15 years ago. And there's a place called the Goose and Garden, which is a nursery. And I came back one morning from shooting sunrise somewhere and the geese were on their way home. Uh, they were walking down this path. So I thought, well, that's cool. So I jumped out of the car with a camera and the geese stopped and looked at me and I, and I shooed them back up the hill. And uh, I explained to them what I was trying to do and asked them just to stay there for a few minutes while I went back to the position where I could take their photograph. So I ran back to the car and turned around and they're right there at my feet. I said, no, no, you don't understand. I gotta do this again. So basically I learned that herding geese was not easy. And uh, at some point after doing this three or four times, they all just stood there and looked at me like, what are you doing? So this was my favorite photograph that came out of it. They were rather indignant when they walked by. Actually, this one on the foreground, you can see had you know, ruffled feathers from the experience. Um, these are chairs that are set up at the spring house uh, on their front lawn. So um, basically every night at sunsets, they're filled with people having cocktails and looking out over the water. And this is a place called Ballard's, which is right across from the ferry when you get off. And uh, it's kind of cool because Ballard's, all of their umbrellas are the same. So it gave me a nice texture to work with. And I, um, if you live on Block Island, and as I do, uh, end up a little closer to the end of the runway than you'd like to be, uh, you're not crazy about helicopters going over all the time. But the truth is, as a photographer, it's kind of nice to have a helicopter to use when you want to. So I went up a couple of times and did uh, aerials of Block Island. And this particular day, it looked like I was in the Bahamas. I've never seen the water that color before or since. It was just amazing. I was going to say, I've been to Black Island once and I've never seen the water look like that. Yeah. Like, everybody thinks I made it up, but I didn't. Uh, this is one of the, one of the towers out there. Um, yeah, they're pretty cool. Um, this is Rebecca, who's a statue at the end of uh, the main drag there on Ocean Avenue. Uh, this is a picture from inside the ferry on uh, just after we've gotten to the island um, of the uh, Atlantic and what is now the, um, uh, well, actually the two main hotels that are right on the main drag there. And this is the Christmas tree for Block Island. They set this up every year uh, right on the main drag there. And uh, it's hysterical, it's wonderful. I mean, it's beautifully done. And, and the nautical theme is pretty obvious. Uh, this is me, in case you're wondering. Um, this is the point where um, it's at the point up right out from the uh, north light where the water comes and kind of comes around the island and sort of bangs into each other. So. Uh, and this is my other near constant companion when I'm out shooting. This is Oliver. He's a schnoodle. And um, he, we've got this thing going where he knows if I get down and he's up ahead of me and he sees me stoop down that it's time for a run by. So invariably he runs full speed and then glances over me just to let me know that he's paying attention. Um, this was a very, very cold morning at sunrise. Um, that's blowing snow that you see there. So I was lying in the snow while I took this picture. And this is Southeast Light. So this is one of our monuments that um, they moved it. Uh, and I've actually, I apologize, I don't know how far, but it was like a hundred feet up from the, basically Black Island is eroding. And uh, so they picked up the whole lighthouse and they moved it back to a safer distance from the edge. Uh, this is where how it's situated now. And it, Block Island has got, I don't know, 30 beaches. And this is one over on the west side. It's, all the, it's just all these rocks this size. And the rocks are, uh, you know, eight inches to 10 inches to smaller than that. And there was a group of guys having a campfire out there and this is one of their dogs running by. So I grabbed it. Buck Island was formed by glaciers uh, like 120,000 years ago or something. So it's, uh, the terrain is just gorgeous. A lot of people say it reminds them of Ireland. Um, so it's not, except for the beaches, there's nothing flat about Block Island. It's just these beautiful rolling hills. And of course there's, Farmers have put up stone walls everywhere, so, but it's an amazing place. Um, this is Southeast Light again. Do you bring your camera every time you go out on Block Island? Yeah, pretty much. Because uh, every time I don't have it, I need it. And I carry, I've, I've usually got my iPhone with me, but it's really limiting as to what I can do with it after I've got those images. So 
Um, it's just it's just easier to have it with me, and uh, and I'll block out. I even take it out in the middle of the day, which is not something I normally do, uh, because if we go over by the water, then you've got all these wonderful reflections and things. So, yes. So to ask you, I had uh, one of my favorite uh, quotes from uh, Jamie Mazel was someone asked him basically why he took a camera with him everywhere. He says it's so much easier to take pictures when you have a camera. This is from one of the aerials. I have no idea what this conversation was about, but I love the woman's expression. Uh, and this is a, uh, a food cart that parks over near one of the main beaches every day. It's called Pots and Kettles. Uh, and this little house is right down from the spring house. Um, and it's uh, there's a certain time of year when the light comes through the window, so I always try to get it when I'm down there. And I went out uh, two years ago and I did Block Island Race Week. And uh, I'd never shot sailing before, though I like to go sailing. And um, because I have this, I don't know what it is, but somehow th nice things happen for me. So I had no plans as to how to get on a boat. Um, and uh, I met a woman that was in charge of assigning the uh, professional photographers that shoot racing all the time. And she says, I think we got a spot over here. Do you want to go out with them? So I went out with three other really great, nice photographers. Uh, and we went out and it was really rough seas the whole time we went out there this whole week long. And, you know, within 30 seconds, all three of them were soaked through, including and all their their Canon cameras were soaking wet. And uh, I managed to always be in the spot where I never got hit. So if anybody wants to know if you're shooting uh, sailboat racing, a 100 to 400 millimeter is like the perfect lens for that. This was an amazing moonrise um, uh, during one of the super moons several years ago. This is a sunset over on the uh, eastern side of the island. And you can see what the terrain is like. It's, uh, it's pretty amazing. And actually, our little cottage is 120 feet above sea level. Um, here's the tractor I liked. Yeah. This one, it was sitting out in the farmer's field. And I think what it, it was there basically because it's sort of, it's like an art project that he does. I noticed it now on, the, on where I live. He's got, he's got a couple of tractors that he parks out there and occasionally moves them around. But they're really just because they're a nice place to leave them and they look good. So uh, I liked it. And I took this on my last trip out uh, last spring. Uh, I was just, I just gotten into bed and the thunderstorm rolled in. So I threw on some clothes and went out and I spent the evening chasing lightning around the island. Um, so I got this right near town, that little green light there is the entrance to the harbor. And then I went up to Southeast Light because it's one of our things we've got to work with. And I got this, which was kind of fun. So color and lightning. And then, uh, Canon was nice enough to lend me a 500 millimeter lens when I was out there shooting Block Island Race Week. So that this was taken with a 500. And this is during the uh, the nesting season. So these are all seagulls out there, you know, basically staking out their territory every year. That's it. Yeah. So that's the West Image page. Great. So I do have some questions for you. Um, okay. So someone was asking, do you carry model releases with you all the time? I shoot with a Canon 5D Mark IV. Oh, <laughs> we got it. It's one of those things I didn't write down. I'm sorry, <laughs> could you ask that question again? Yes. <laughs> do you carry model releases with you all the time? Um, you know, I've got a couple in my bag. I used to carry them all the time because about 80% of my income was from stock photography licensing. Um, and so I've, I've got, I usually have three or four that are folded into my camera bag. 
uh, and I used to use them all the time. It doesn't come up very much anymore because pretty much when you're doing fine artwork now, uh, the releases, the releases aren't important like they were for the stock photography thing. And, uh, and everything is royalty free now, which is not something I've ever cared for particularly. So, but yes, I do have them with me. And I keep some in the car too. So. Got it. Um, and then there were some questions about the paper. How do you choose a paper for uh, water pictures or pictures with water? Um, well, you know, I have, I have a tendency to find something that really works and that's what I use. Um, so the uh, Entrada Rag Bright, I fell in love with after trying seven or eight other papers. And that was the one that just, I just love. Um, and so I would say 90% of what I print on is that. Um, and then the other day I was printing uh, with, uh, um, uh, I had a roll of Slick Rock, which I hadn't really used much. And I used it with a, a photograph that I did of a series of these little, uh, it's a composite of caravans, you know, like the little trailers that I did. And I thought, well, this would be interesting metal on metal. So um, I made several prints with that and the Slick Rock was really cool. So. I think I'm going to be reprinting a lot of my industrial stuff. Um, if you can see this in the background, but this was from an industrial show. Um, and, but the slick rock could work really well for that, I think. So, um, but there it's that. And then the, uh, uh, for, it works well for the water. Um, so it's, a, uh, and then also what happens too, is that the, uh, the Anasazi canvas, um, seems to work well for just about everything. And uh, interesting too, for me, I feel like finally I can get the same clarity off of the canvases that I get off the paper a lot of the time. Um, and do you want, can I say something else about the Entrada stuff? Yeah, one yeah, of, one of the great <laughs> well, One of the great things about having a gallery is that you get to see what people respond to. And I know if I put up a show with 20 or 25 photographs, there's gonna be three or four, which everybody is attracted to and I never know which ones those are until after the show. Um, but when I did the, uh, where is it? Let's see. Oh. This, uh, where is it? Yeah, over here. The pictures from the, of the rusted vehicles. This one down below, uh, it's an old Oldsmobile. And that series was wonderful because of just everything was, uh, it was what happens to cars when they're left outside for 40 or 50 years. And this was from a 1955 Oldsmobile, I think. Um, but uh, I printed on Entrada Rag Right, which is what that is right there. And a gentleman came into the gallery and looked at it for a long, long time. And finally he said, you gotta help me out here. I said, well, okay, sure, what, what is it? He goes, I'm looking at this and my, and I know that this is a piece of two dimensional art, but my brain is convinced it's three dimensional. So there's something about the quality of the paper and how it reacts with the inks that gives it a, a, a whole lot of depth that I had never gotten in other papers before. So and that's, I'm kind of sold on the Entrada Rag, right? <laughs> when you print for a gallery, do you pick all of the same paper or will you mix the canvas with some Entrada with some metallic paper? Yeah, it's, uh, it's whatever works best. Um, if, uh, and the people that I'm showing it to don't know. Um, they just know that they like it or not. So, uh, but it's a lot of times the, um, I, sh I use the canvas for larger prints. So they're usually the piece, when you walk into the gallery, there's a big wall. And on that wall would be the, one of the 44 by 66 prints that's done in canvas. Um, and, uh, and then it just kind of depends there. Well, hang on, I'll take you over here. This picture here, uh, this is called used well, um, but it's, it's printed on canvas. And then next to it here is this one called Endangered, which is actually uh, a scene from, uh, that I took in 1985, I think at the San Francisco Zoo. Uh, it was a mural that had been out and weathered for many, many years and it had almost no color left. So the great thing about Photoshop I was able to go in and not only find the color, but bring it back. But those, because the canvas has a more texture than what you get with the, um, with the papers or most of the time, uh, it's great for these uh, distressed pieces that I print. All right, there's one more, hang on. This one here, 
this print is uh, 55 by uh, 90 inches. Uh, and it's from the Palace Amusement Park in Asbury Park, New Jersey. And actually we just sold the print this size uh, last week and took it framed to a client's house. So, but that's also on canvas. So um, especially with the bigger prints too, they're much easier to handle if they're on canvas because they're much more forgiving. Right. And now that you're showing everything in your gallery, you, you can imagine you're getting a ton of questions about the framing system that you're using. Ah, okay. The, the Which I knew it was gonna happen. <laughs> Everybody loves the framing system. It's, and it's real, so simple. Um, it's a company called Poster Hanger. And uh, you can find them online under posterhanger.com. And I should have been a salesperson for them because I know I've gotten at least 500 people to buy them. Um, but for me, they're perfect for the gallery because I found that when, when I first started the gallery, uh, I had everything in simple black frames with white mats. And, uh, and that worked pretty well, except a lot, most, not most, but a lot of people would say, well, these are nice, but do you have any white frames or like a, do you have like a maple frame? And I realized that, you know, everybody's got their own taste in that. I think frames are sort of like furniture that way. Uh, and it's also a chance for the people that are buying the print to actually have a, have part of the artistic experience themselves when they go to the framer. So, so these basically let me put up a show really quickly. I can get a picture up on the wall in about maybe three minutes. And uh, what's cool about it is if they come in certain sizes and if you get, if you make your print to the right size, I mean, they're normal sizes, like, so you can get a, a 60 inch or you can get a 36 inch, 24 inch. Um, if you put the right size paper in them, um, they only have one hole on the top, which you can hang on a nail or I hang on my hanging system here. And they can't help but hang straight. You know, that's just the, the balance is perfect. And, um, so yeah, it's, and I highly recommend it for everybody, especially photographers, because uh, they don't offer any protection at all for the prints, but we can all make our own again if we want to. So uh, it's worked out really well. And everybody comes in and I mean, people tell me all the time, I love the hanging system because it's so clean. So there you go. Yeah, I think we actually use the same ones at our trade shows. And everyone comes up and is like, where, where is the hanging system from? So you said it's called posterhangers.com? Yeah. Okay, I'll put it in the, I'll put that in the chat for everyone. Posterhangers.com. Um, and then you do have some more questions about printing. So someone was saying for your 13 by 19 prints, do you print borderless? Um, no. Because, because if I want to if I want to frame it, uh, that makes it so that I can't really have the signature showing, um, unless you're signing it on the on the image itself. And people, I mean, basically now what I've always done for the last you know 15 years or so is uh, I put the name of the print and then I sign it on the bottom edge, and they usually get framed with a three quarter inch white paper showing you know behind the mat or in front of the mat. Um, so yeah, that's, did I answer that question? Yes. So you do put a border on it. I do. I, I, I yeah, the, the borderless thing is like, you're just trying to get as much picture out of the paper as possible. And my suggestion would be to just use a bigger piece of paper. Um, but it's, uh, actually one of my favorite sizes too, are the 17 by 22s. They're, uh, what's, and what I will tell you, interestingly enough, is that I have, Around the room here, there's four kiosks that have the 13 by 19 prints. And my wife's an interior designer. She hates 13 by 19 prints because they're not big enough to make a statement. And uh, I have them because they're really my final test print. So they make sense for me to have them and I wasn't gonna just throw them away. But they don't sell that well. I mean, basically, my mind is that always people are gonna look at them and go, can you make this bigger? And that's what part of the but so there's certain signs around the gallery now that actually show a picture of a man standing in front of different size prints. So you can, and it just says these photographs are all available in these different sizes. So, yeah, yeah. that's true. I mean, I, I feel like the larger prints are, they trend now, they're very much trending. Um, do you suggest a framer for people to go to or is it kind of up to them to find a framer once you sell the print? Um, I try to help them out wherever I can. I have uh, two local framers I work with all the time. So if they're, if, and a lot of people come to the Berkshires and spend the summer. Right. Uh, 
So for them, and actually I printed I've got a deliver to a woman. She came in and bought it a couple of days ago and it's ready to go. And, um, and I, she asked the other day, she said, can you suggest somebody for me to frame, get framed while we're here? So I just passed that information along and, um, and what else? Yeah, sometimes if somebody's in the New York area, I've got a couple of people that I know in New Jersey. So I'll say, well, this is who I know here in case you're interested. Um, but most of the time, uh, a lot of people say, oh no, I've got a frame. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's just up in the air. And we have, we try not to ship frames, frame fixtures because of the hassle of uh, shipping large objects. And especially if you want to put glass on them or museum glass, they've got to be packed extremely well to get to where they're going, so. Oh yes, I do. Yeah. Um, so now you have a question. What is the highest point in Block Island? Trick question. Um, <laughs> let's see, I'm, let's see, 120. I don't, I don't have an actual number for you. I would say probably it's around 200 feet. Um, what's interesting, you know, it's like you're, no matter what, there's always something that doesn't work out exactly like you think it ought to. And that is that, you know, we just got our insurance bill <laughs> for, uh, for the Block Island Cottage, which had gone up and, and um, it turns, and I, th I thought, this is great. You're 120 feet above sea level. So nobody's gonna give us a hard time about, you know, storms from a water standpoint. But their issue is that what they don't want is high winds. So, um, and on Block Island, we do do high winds quite well. So, um, so we're up and we're up pretty close to, uh, to the top of the, literally the top of the mountain there. What's also interesting, another interesting fact uh, about this is that our water quality is excellent because when you're living on the top of the island as we do, um, the, uh, it's like the, the water table is set up like your eye. So there's a, there's a lens of water at the top that's a couple hundred feet deep. So, you know, our, our, our well goes down just far enough to get it, but there's a lot of water under where we're living. And then, but by the time you get down to sea level, uh, all those really beautiful homes right down there by the water have all got special desalinization systems down in their basements because they're trying to, they have to get the salt water out so they can find, use the whatever water they can use for what they're doing. So being on top of the mountain is a good idea. And the view is much better. Someone else is asking, how many days would you recommend someone go to Block Island in order to experience the full island? Um, well, okay, so one of my, one of the things on my trip sheet here, which I kind of know by heart anyway, but essentially uh, it's not very big. Um, and people bike all around Block Island very easily. So they come out on their bikes, they spend the day and they just ride around. You can go from one end of the island really easily. It's, um, Block Island is, in that first picture, it's shaped like a pork chop. And it's uh, seven miles long at the longest point and three miles wide at the widest point. And uh, it's got a good network of roads that go all around it. And so um, you can, you know, I would say that if you really want to, well, you can see, you can, literally you could see everything in a day, but you can't enjoy the trails. And Block Island, 40% of Block Island is preserved. Uh, so there's never gonna be a development on it. If the Block Island Conservancy um, uses their money to buy up land so that uh, the island just doesn't become an island of houses. And um, you pay a, I think it's 3% of your purchase price goes to the Block Island Conservancy, which is added on to your price. Um, but I would say if you can go out for a week, uh, you could do a long weekend, but uh, the weather is such that if you're there for a week, you're pretty much guaranteed about getting some good weather and some interesting weather. Um, and uh, a lot of people that rent our cottage rent it for a couple of weeks. So, and we find that the same people keep coming back year after year after year, so. Right, right. And just know that if you go to Black Island, do you, you don't have to rent a bike, but there are very few cars, right? No, no, there's, well, there's a lot of cars. What, here's the tricky part. One of the things that it's always a bone of contention is that uh, many years ago, one of the guys that was the bike runner guy uh, also started renting mopeds. So the island is covered with mopeds during the summertime. And it's basically covered with mopeds driven by people that don't know what they're doing. So um, there every year there's some really horrific accidents for, 
uh, for people that are riding on, on mopeds and don't really know what they're doing. Um, so they're not, it's, uh, they're all wearing helmets, which is good, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a lot of work for the rescue squad. For people that are, it's just, it's, a, there's a lot of folks on Block Island this summer. In the off season, it's like 1,051 people live there. That's the last census I saw. Um, but during the summer, it swells up to many, many thousands of people. And, uh, and that's just, and that sometimes that's just day trippers that come out for the day and then hop on a moped and go cruise around the island as right. fast as they can. So, um, right. Well, we don't have any more questions, but um, I did put your website in the chat. So it's scottfarrowphotography.com. And do you sell your prints? Actually, Sorry, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, scottfarrow.com is the name of it, though. So, oh, scottfarrow.com. Yeah. Um, and do you sell the images on your website? I do. Yeah, anything that you click on, it's got a little symbol there for um, a grocery cart or a shopping cart. And uh, so all the photographs are for sale. And, um, and some of them are, most of them are open edition prints. Um, I do have some limited edition prints, but that's mostly because people made me do it. You know, and I'm much more interested in taking photographs and keeping track of numbers of the photographs. So, um, but yes, they are available. They can be bought on the on the website, and also anybody is welcome to call me. Um, I'm actually one of those people that still enjoys using a telephone. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so I, I enjoy talking to people about photography, and uh, and also if somebody's got some image they're interested in, depending on what they're looking for. What I know is on the website, there's maybe one hundredth of one percent of what's available, um, and I'm shooting constantly, so that keeps changing. So. Uh, so I, you know, if somebody sees something like this, but do you have something a little different? I can do selections too. Yeah. Wow, that's great. And do you have anything that's coming up that you want people to know about? Um, we have, uh, what's coming up? Let's see. Well, my oldest daughter's getting married. Oh, that's so that's, that's <laughs> taking up a certain level of my, of my time. And, uh, and right now I'm fighting a cell tower that they want to put next to my house. So. <laughs> I've been a little sidetracked by that, but um, yeah, actually, I'm getting. I'm. I've just started uh, printing a show um, that's going to go up. I think in the next two weeks, and still picking the images for that. But so this was kind of a way. I just as a just as an aside here, but why I'm in this space. Um, uh, when I first moved to the Berkshires in 2002, there was absolutely no office space anywhere that I could find. Um, I found one spot that had no windows in Great Barrington. And through uh, getting to know a, a real estate agent who I had cocktails with one night, she said, I think Charlie's got a space up above Bistro Zinc, which is where we are now. So I walked into this place and it's the best surprise in Lennox because you walk up the stairs and you come in sort of at floor eye level and you look up and our ceilings are 18 feet high. And I've got three Palladian windows here and maple floors. And so uh, from 2002 to 2009, I had my gallery here and I built all the walls and then took a couple years off and started another gallery and now I'm back here where I started. So we're gonna have a, a show of all new work to go with being in the same old new space. So that's, well, that's exciting, it looks great. Oh, the other thing I wanna say page two is that if uh, depending on interest, one of the, um, it's been a, a transition year for us, of course, with the pandemic going on, my wife and I decided, well, gee, what could we do to make the pandemic more interesting? So we decided to sell our house of 18 years and move um, and then move to offices. So um, it kind of curtailed a lot of my being able to do uh, seminars and things, but I've always wanted to do uh, a seminar out on Block Island. And so I'm gonna to try to get that set up to see if anybody's interested in coming out in the fall, because it's one of the prettiest times to be out there. And the rates go down too in the fall. So if people yeah. want to come out. So I'll post that on the website too, in case anybody's interested. Yeah, that'd be great. And I'll, I can also post it in the YouTube link just so people can see it. Um, so I did mention that this was recorded and we will oh, be great. posting this on YouTube in about a week. Um, and we'll send an email when the recording is up if you wanna go back to anything that you may have missed. Um, and I did put the link to the poster hanger system in the chat. There was no S on it, so that's the new link. Um, but thank you so much, Scott, this was fun. Thanks everybody for coming, I appreciate it. All right, thanks everyone.